Hey everybody, welcome back to the Catholic Talk Show. Today we are talking about 10 things that Catholics are sick of hearing, right Ryan? That's right. We're talking about all those things that people have told you that are completely false about the Catholic faith and things that are lies and slanders and we're going to clear all those falsehoods up today. These are the things that make Catholics go, because it's just we're sick of it and it's time to lay them to rest today. I'm really excited about this episode. We're here with Ryan Shield, Father Rich Pagano. I'm Ryan Delacross. Guys, I'm 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 happy to to be back for another show here. Yeah, I know cool. it's beautiful California right now. It's gorgeous day in Cast Media Studios, and it is always a joy to be with you guys for sure. Is it yeah. though? It is. Sometimes it makes me sick. It does? Yeah, a little bit. Like the things that we're going to talk about today? Uh, absolutely. But even Ryan Delacross last night when he was just sneezing and, you know, <laughs> slobbering all over the place. and Stop it. I think I woke up with a couple of sniffles this morning. Yeah, you had all kinds of sniffles. <laughs> I sneezed like 50 times this morning. Do you hear that? Yeah, yeah. I know. I've never blessed a priest so much. <laughs> it felt odd. I was receiving a lot of blessing this morning, you people. Were. <laughs> so, yeah, we're talking about 10 things that Catholics are sick of hearing. And these are things that I'm sure that if you're engaged in your faith and you've talked to people uh, on the internet or uh, engaged with people of other faiths or other denominations, you've heard these things and they're things that are uh, deeply held misconceptions about what the Catholic Church is. And we're going to dispel those today. Now, yeah. before we do, I want to talk about one thing that really does make me sick. And that's when, um, when you folks don't go to CatholicTalkShow.com and click subscribe uh, to our YouTube, to our um, iTunes. Uh, and you should be following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it, it's that that is the medicine for what is making us sick. And I've got to say, as a priest, I have to participate in the life and ministry of Jesus as divine physician. So here's a little medicine. That's right. Click subscribe. Support yeah. us. It's easy. And there's a whole nother way you could support us now as well. Right. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic talk show, uh, you're going to be able to help ensure that we can continue making these episodes and dispelling all these falsehoods and sharing all the cool information that we do with you and uh, making more Catholic talk shows happen. Uh, it's really easy. Just a couple dollars can help make sure that uh, Father Rich isn't. Uh, living in the priest box where there's uh, no talk shows to be had. <laughs> we need this talk show to get out there, and we would really appreciate if you are truly joining us as a patron on Patreon. So make sure yeah. you click that link and support us. Yep. And and then we're going to do a lot of new cool stuff too, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, we have it's a whole bring plan us back rolling together. together. Yeah. yeah, it's going to bring us back together to do other things too, It'll which be is cool. exciting. Yeah, exclusive mm -hmm. content, which is it's going to be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, let's get into the episode. Yeah, the content today mm -hmm. is things I don't know, I'm sure from you guys, you know, interacting with people in your own communities and at the club or wherever, that you have experiences where people have a perception of a Catholic belief or instruction or teaching yeah. that is like, what the heck? Well, where did you get that from? Yeah, just being from Jacksonville, Florida, which is the Bible Belt, it's the capital of South Georgia pretty much, right? So it's like, you know, there's not a lot of Catholics in, in Jacksonville, Florida, you know, per capita, right? So it's not like going to the Northeast. And so I got a lot of this stuff growing up, man. Remember one of our listeners reached out to us who lives truly in the Bible belt. And he's, he's like, you know, you guys listening to you just makes me want to become Catholic, but I don't know any Catholics. And yeah. I said to him like, dude, you know us, that's all you need. You know? <laughs> so it. it's been it. cool to have that ministry. Yeah. Uh, Fulton Sheen, one of my favorite, he said something I think really instructive. He said, there's millions of people in America who hate what they think is the Catholic church. But there's very, very few people who actually hate what the Catholic Church is in reality. And a lot of the misconceptions uh, about the church are poor, poorly educa educated people not really knowing what the Catholic Church teaches. And this is not just non-Catholics. This is Catholics as well. I mean, yeah, just think about like, I mean, like if you're an engineer, right, and, and you know engineering and somebody comes up to you like, yeah, you got to put that thing like that over there. And he's like... <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of math that goes into this, bro. Like it just sounded dumb, you know? And so like I, I heard a Joe Rogan uh, podcast and he's like, I think the Catholic church is a cult. And I'm like, dude, you didn't even like, you, you research everything, but on this, it's like, it was, it was just really shallow, mm -hmm. right. you know? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's the, it's easy. If it's easy, right? I, I, I've read that if Christ came back today, he wouldn't be crucified. He would be, he would suffer um, through indifference. 
And that's the indifference that people feel towards religion allows them to have these conceptions without any sort of uh, reality behind right. them, without any sort of depth behind them. They hear it once, it suits their agenda, and then they stick with it. And that's what most of these things on this list are. So, And this is a moment that when you, when you encounter this where you can teach somebody, right? I mean, this is like why we're here, right. to share the gospel. It's always an invitation yeah. to share why you believe what you believe. And it's what St. Peter says in the scriptures as well. Be prepared, my brothers and sisters, at all times to give testimony to that which you believe. And these topics that we're going to cover today are specifically areas of the evangelical out front of the church yep. because we need to be out there representing truly what Catholics believe and what is instructed in the catechism. Yeah, so we're going to give you... Uh, 10 things. We're going to give you 10, 10 arrows to put in your... Quiver. Uh, quiver. Into, right into your quiver. So first thing, and this is the one I'm... I'm sure you've heard this. Catholics aren't Christians. They're like, so are you Catholic or are you Christian? You ever hear that one? All the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Down in the South. I don't even know what to say. That, that one's just like, mm -hmm. wow. Seriously? Well, what's, what's interesting, too, even in the, in the original uh, deposit of the faith and the apostles are spreading the faith, there was a treatment of Christianity, of Catholicism, and the name associated with the movement was the Nazareans. And you know that scripture that says, you know, what good can come from Nazareth? Right. So it was this derogatory statement that people would say culturally against the movement of the person of Jesus Christ. It's mm. like, oh, you're one of those Nazareans? Yeah. And and that's where the the first nominal Christianity was was formed, was right there in Nazarene. But later on in the centuries, it became Catholicos. <laughs> well, even before that in the Bible, in Acts 11.26, uh, they're talking Paul and Barnabas and the way. Well, right? no, not necessarily. Them? They're saying that um, Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch. Now, Antioch is one of the five, uh, one of the five fundamental seas, right? It's one of the five patriarchal, patriarchal seas, and it says there that that is the place where the word Christian was far, first started to be used to describe followers of Christ. So, in Acts eleven twenty six, it says. And that's where they were first start to be called Christians. Whoa. Now, I'm not great at history. I am actually. <laughs> but He's so humble. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Acts 11.26 was written before the 1850s when, you know, um, Reverend Jim Bob at the 14th Pentecostalist Church of First Street <laughs> started saying we were the right Christians. So I would just say that historically, Catholics have been around a lot longer and Christians, the use of the word Christians goes back to the very beginning of the church. And I don't know well, if this is going into the, uh, to another one, but like scripture, I mean, it's like, it came from, it came from a Catholic. Oh, we're going to get, yeah, we're going. Right okay. There. I didn't that's know if we're precisely, going there. That's precisely it. So scripture on a sola scriptura level, of course, people only Bible outside of our means. denomination of Catholic, the Catholic religion right. are going to say, well, Catholic, I don't remember reading Catholic in the right. Bible. So... Catholics are not Christians. There's something different. And what does that word even mean? Well, see, they, uh, Protestants, and typically fundamentalist or evangelical, there is hundreds, probably actually, I'm sorry, there's thousands of different variations of denominations. Yeah. And they have no one way of saying what is a Christian and what is not, because there's no agreement amongst them. Yeah. Um, for Catholics, it's very easy. A Christian is somebody who believes in Jesus Christ and has been baptized into the new life with him. Mm -hmm. That's Christian. And the profession mm -hmm. of the creed is a, is right. a yeah. most important thing. It's too. a statement, mm -hmm. you know. And even as an aside, when one is excommunicated and when they are brought back in, say, through the apostolic penitentiary in Rome, which we've talked about in previous episodes, that they have to, one, go to confession but then in the presence of the bishop or, you know, archbishop or in the in the penitentiary itself to profess the creed is an absolute central point mm. to the lifting of excommunication. Wow. And when you think about it, confirmation as well is that profession of the creed when a child is brought up through infant baptism to a point of, you know, rationality yeah. that a child can express the articles of faith and profess the creed. And to say, this is credo. This is something that I believe. All right, now, this is a little bit outside of the topic, but I've got a really hot take here. And for everyone who's a... This is always my favorite thing, Ryan Shield, when you give this, a hot take. This is a hot take. Everyone, give it to us, man. Everyone in the East, we know how sensitive you are, so you might want to cover your ears. <laughs> 
I think the creed needs to be updated. Mm. Ooh. I Whoa. think it's time that there's a, there's a um, council to add something to the creed. And that is the belief in the true presence of in oh, the Eucharist. Yeah. Jesus in the Eucharist. Yeah. That's not in the creed. Now, That's a very interesting point. I think that needs I think that needs to be in the creed fundamentally. Mm. Yeah. I mean that's it's a hot take. Hot take Ryan Ryan Shields saying the creed needs updated. And this is a conciliar type of a thing. We're having a, right. a, a very deep conversation about this. What do you guys think? Is the Eucharist, should the Eucharist be a part of the creed? In the comments section below on our social media platforms, let us know what you think. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's actually a very, very good point. And then we'll send that petition to Rome, and then next show we'll have a And new then creed. That's, how, that's how dogmas <laughs> are decreed naturally. And oh, really? I think it, it I, mean, I mean, the the true presence is not debatable. No, but it's not. The, I think it is fundamental to the true Catholic Christian Dude, it, faith. I had, conver- right. I had a conversion. I had a my conversion was was in front of the Eucharist, right. man. Yeah, it's, it's a dogma. Like, yeah. Speaking of dogs, dogs. So, just an aside, some of you may have listened to a previous episode. Do all Catholic dogs go to heaven? Here we go. Well, he's, he's still on this. No, and I, I am because Ryan Shiel and I continue to argue this. But I think it's pretty hilarious that at our apartment where we're renting, in the living room is a stone statued carving of a dog's head. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just it's stared at Ryan Shiel yeah, the and entire time. It has no time. soul, and it's been <laughs> annihilated, and it's. Its existence is no more, and it went to anywhere. If it went to anywhere, it went to dog hell. Well, besides this bickering, the bickering of what we're talking right. about today happens all the time. And I do oh. think the nominal realities of what Catholic means is something that is always an opportunity when people say, you're not even Christian, you're Catholic. Well, no, I am totally Christian. I've been baptized. I profess the creed and my belief of Jesus as son of God. However... Catholic, what it actually means is universal, that this is a revelation from God to the universe, that his only begotten son has come to redeem us. And this redemption is for all. Jesus is that son of God who enters into the world, you know, and and that reality is important, that it is for all. And that's what Catholic truly means etymologically. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, everyone who holds that belief, but uh, Catholics were Christians, and they were the first Christians. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing that you can say to dispute that. And I'm sick of hearing it. Stop saying it. It's done. It's over. Before Ew. your church was even founded, Catholics were Christians. Go cry in the 14th Pentecostal Baptistery Church of Main Street. And in the name of the, <laughs> of, of the new 1826 synod, go cry there and we will give you our Christian Be nice, prayers. Ryan. No. You need nice. to have a little bit of Where's charity. The love? In the name Come of on. the divine physician, will, Jesus Christ, I say, be healed of that <laughs> sickness. Nice. Next, next one. All right, next we one. We love these people. All right. This is one I'm sick of hearing. The Catholics changed the Bible. Do we change the Bible? Absolutely not. The, the, the thing is, is when it comes to canons, right? So what, how these were distributed when we think of like Qumran or the Dead Sea Scrolls or, you know, we have these old articles that, that were written, you know, expressions of, of the prophets, et cetera. These were scrolls. They were, they were individual realities. And what the Bible is, is a, a library. It's a library, right? It's a library of those types of scrolls or quote unquote books, right? Yep. So, different letters of the apostles, different gospels. Uh, that's that's what the Bible is. And then you have the Old Testament, which is the law, the prophets, Psalms. Those are, again, individual scrolls, individual books. And you're exactly right. The Bible is a library. Yeah. And it was put together. It was it was the bishops like read hundreds of these things like not there wasn't like all of them were right here. Like, yeah, let's just go ahead and bind this thing up and make it into this library. It was like they, were, they had to discern a lot of different. Writings. So, mm-hmm. for all the people who say that Catholics changed the Bible, I've got very bad news. Of you. <laughs> bad actually, news for you: Catholics made the Bible. Catholics yeah. created the Bible. Before that, it was just a bunch of scrolls. It was Catholic Church and the bishops of the Catholic Church working with the inspiration of the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit to yeah. set canon. Now, um, canon was first declared um, in three ninety three at the Council of Hippo. Right. Mm. So that's the first time you see a list that resembles the modern Bible. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Council of Hippo, Carthage in 397, and then Carthage in 419. So before that, there was a lot of books. There was the Apocalypse of St. Peter. There was 
um, the gospel, the proto gospel of James. James there was yeah. um, the shepherd of Hermias. There was a lot of different books that were considered good for Christians to read. Right. But they said these are not divinely inspired. These are educational or profitable for a Christian to read, right. but they are not divinely inspired I, scripture. I even think of Eusebius's history. How awesome would that be if it was in everybody's edition of the Bible so that they could have that historical objective viewpoint? But that's not what the Bible is, right? The mm -hmm. Bible is in this canon, which means basically like a measure, the measure of, of you know, reasonability without error. And this is why there's so much repeated things in the New Testament, especially in the in the four Gospels. Yeah. You know, they're the same accounts, but they're delivered in a different manner. But there's perfect logic and there is no error within them theologically. All right. So yeah. so one of the reasons that detractors say that the church changed uh, the Bible is because they don't have the same amount of books in their Bible. They took seven books out. What now, is it, the Apocrypha or something like that? Well, that's, that's what they'll use to call it. So okay. they're, um, the, the canon of the, of the scripture is never really contested until Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther didn't like seven particular books in the Old Testament. Um, and that's because they didn't really jive with his new theology. All right now, I know many very fine Lutherans. Um, my brother-in-law, one of the best dudes I've ever met, Lutheran. We have some great, I know some great Lutheran pastors, but they're wrong on this and that's okay, but you're wrong and I'm sick of hearing it. So what happened is that, so Martin Luther challenged this and the basis of his challenge was that the scriptures that the, the, the seven deuterocanonical books were not books that the Jews recognized, right? So Catholics our Old Testament is based on the Septuagint, right? Which is the Greek diaspora version of the Old Testament. Now, when you look at the New Testament and when Jesus or the apostles quote scripture, it's almost always quoting it directly from this version of it. But after the fall of Jerusalem and the Romans destroying um, the temple, there is a supposed council called the Council of Jamnia, which is a Jewish council, where they set their canon, right? And their canon excluded these seven books that were only found in the Greek Jewish version and not the uh, Jewish, 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 Jewish version. Hebrew. Right? The one that was not in the, the diaspora. So that is the line of demarcation where the Bible drifted. Right. These books are in the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible, because number one, they have things in it that explicitly talk about prayers for the dead and purgatory and things that really went against what Martin Luther was trying to uh, innovate. So they removed it. It wasn't They like, straight up removed yeah, it. Yeah, they just took them out. And, it, to, and as justification, he used that it was never in there in the first place, but that's because it was a supposed council where the Jews were trying to distance themselves from diaspora huh. Jews because of their new... Uh, their kind of new status in the empire where the Romans were crushing them. Yeah. Now, this was now 14, well, when the Council of Trent happened, that's when the church, again, dogmatically said, this is council. So then Protestants say, well, you didn't change it until the you know Council of Trent. You, that's when the, you added books to the Bible. But that's not true. What a council does is it defines dogma, it defines an issue when there is a serious challenge to it. Otherwise, it doesn't need to. This they didn't the add anything. They, they didn't just, add anything. They just, they said just it was, confirmed it right. what they had always taught and what everyone had always taught. But and I didn't so, know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, you weren't paying attention in that class in in uh, seminary. seminary. No. <laughs> All right. I was eating Fritos. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think something to take away from this is the consideration that the church is ever at task in the body of the faith to be able to delineate what is the theology that is being communicated through the scriptures and making that deliverable for a mass appeal so that people may have that inspired word of God in their life and that it may not lead them to error, but to greater salvation and to greater understanding. And 
you know, what Ryan Schill is saying, you know, this makes me sick. It's not that Ryan saying that, you know, we're sick of Protestants, but it's important to, to say like, no, you know, this is the contents of our Bible and there's an integrity to that. And there was great counsel over that. So maybe to look a little bit more deeply into what is contained in those letters that were removed and why they were removed. You know, yeah. what's really crazy to think about is when when all this stuff was going on, right? It was the first time the Bible was ever, there was something called a printing press, mm -hmm. right? And and so once the printing press came out, people were messing with scripture and they're still doing it today. I mean, how many versions do we have, right? Um, and there's straight up versions of the Bible I read and I'm like, this is crazy, right? Like teaching on the Eucharist, just completely removed, you know, out of, out of scripture. I don't know which one it was, but I, I read it's one. It's so like, true. Yeah. And when you think about what happened prior to Gutenberg's printing press and how there were scribes for day, their whole lot, these monks, their whole lives were, they were recording and they were writing and they were writing and writing. Think of that type of suffering and that sacrifice and that, and that offering of their yeah. lives to this. It's, it's just absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So the Catholics did not change the Bible. We gave you the Bible. You changed it. I'm sick of hearing it. Stop <laughs> saying it. It's over. That was said with a lot more yeah, charity. Yeah. Right. I, Ryan is, Ryan <laughs> Scheel is definitely developing a charitable <laughs> delivery I on am. that. What's the next thing that we're talking about? <sighs> Catholics worship Mary. <gasps> oh, this is a constant thing. Mm. This is as I'm as I'm holding my rosary yeah. right now, <laughs> I don't. Catholics do not, never have, and never will worship Mary, mm -hmm. and I'm sick of hearing it. Do but you, I do honor her. I love That's my mama. For sure. I love my mama. So, Catholics believe, and this is like every Christian should, that God alone in the Trinity is worthy of worship. Nothing else. We do not, and I will say this definitively. So that I, you never have to say it again. And with charity. Catholics <laughs> do not worship Mary. If you say we do, you're a liar. We don't. I'm sick of hearing it. Stop. And <laughs> let, me say, let me say this as a priest. You know, our worship is truly amplified in a way by the example of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who in the scriptures themselves, her Magnificat is such an important lens to look through. Because what does she say? My soul doth magnify the Lord. It's that magnification, and we, we need examples in our life of how we can magnify and properly worship God. And the Blessed Virgin Mary is a beautiful example of that, as many of the saints are, or even people in our own communities, you know, that, that they truly show us like, wow, that person is so prayerful. That person really does magnify God's glory in the way that they live their life. And that's who Mary is, that example, that model of all Christians. So in the Catholic Church, there is, there's three terms. There's latria, dulia, and hyperdulia. Latria is reserved for God alone. That is worship, set at, worship towards the divinity. Only God in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is due latria. The saints are given what is called dulia, Right. Dulia is like a veneration. That's like holding. It's like having a hero. It's like having a model for your life. Now, the Virgin Mary has a modified version of Dulia, which only she is afforded, which is called hyperdulia. Hyperdulia is reserved for the Virgin Mary because she was the vessel that contained the divinity. She was the co-redemptrix when she cooperated with God's plan for salvation. That's why she gets hyperdulia, which is a it's Dulia on roids. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, <laughs> and you think about how that applies. So this word co-redemptrix, which we've talked about in previous episodes as well on the Blessed Virgin Mary, that's a loaded theological statement. And yeah. John Paul II speaks very emphatically about it. But don't we participate in similar fashion when we are entrusted with the good news and we are sent to and commissioned to go and announce this good news? Because we're participating in that same sense of co-redemption, not because of, you know, like how perfect we are or we're, we're Jesus Christ or we're God. No, but God became, became man so that man can become like God. And in that manner, redemption emanates and in a ripple effect out of our lives. And I think of you, Ryan Delacrosse, 
you are always so willing to enter into somebody's life on the outskirts and, and who are struggling. And, and I have heard you give testimony to brothers and sisters that have come to the faith and have converted because of, of your work with them. And I'm thinking even, even the young man that you've been working with recently yeah. Yeah. in that same regard. Beautiful. Yeah. Another thing too, and I know we're talking through the lens of, we hate to hear it, but you know, like when, when people say, you know, all you need is Jesus for salvation. I'm like, yes, that's all you need. But, but Mary like knows him really well. And if you can kind of, you know, it's just like my mother, if you guys go and talk to my mom and you're like, Hey, this is really great, Ryan, what you're doing with these people. My mom would be like, well, you know, when he was a kid and, you know, just share, you know, she just, she knew me, you know, better. And, and it's it, it, without, without her, you know, and, and, and in Christ, like I wouldn't have the relationship with Christ that I had without her, you know, it actually helps you know, you to, to say yes to Jesus, you know, it doesn't detract you from him. It's actually a, a helper. Yeah. Mary, Mary has no light of her own. All of her light is reflected from her son. Yeah. We do not worship Mary. I'm, I'm sick of hearing it. And when, when you think about the rosary, what are we meditating on scripturally? It's the gospel on a chain. Jesus. It's the gospel on a chain. And it is constantly about the mystery of Jesus. Yep. You know, the annunciation, the visitation, the birth, right? And you could go through every, think of the sorrowful mysteries, right? Everything yeah. is Jesus. Now, the point is, and I think something that would Even be, the coronation is ultimately about Jesus. Absolutely. Because it is yeah. his plan for salvation and, and the way that Catholics or Christians can operate and, and, and heaven. But John I, it, it, Paul II said in a, in a beautiful letter, he said, it is Mary who steadfastly contemplates the face of Christ. It is the steadfast contemplative nature of Mary that shows us that that is what I want to do with my life. Mm -hmm. I want to, in a steadfast manner, contemplate the face of Christ. What does that look like on your face when you're out in public? What does that look like in your day-to-day -day interactions if you are steadfastly contemplating the face of Christ? People recognize that. People see that. And, and you think about a couple that's been married 60, 70 years, and they resemble each other. They look alike, and their facial expressions, their mannerisms, their little idiosyncrasies start to cross over, and they start to express themselves or laugh in a similar way. Think about that with Mary and her only child, Jesus yeah. Christ, the Son of God, and that interaction, intimacy, and likeness is magnificent. Yeah. And the out on the other side, and it's exactly what you were saying before Delacrosse, on the other side of Jesus as, as our salvation is what is he saving us from? The isolation of sin and independence and pride. He's helping us come back together in a greater communion with one another. And that is salvation. We find a place where we belong and we begin to share generously without counting the cost yeah. of letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing or vice versa, you're starting to live for the other. And in that place, that is exactly how Jesus is drawing us back into a place of belonging that is a foretaste of heaven. Yeah. So I'm sick of it. <laughs> sick of it. All right. Here's another thing I'm sick of hearing. Catholics worship statues. Oh. Yeah, that's so stupid. But I've got to say, so I mean, stupid. when you look at some Italians or some Filipinos or some, you know, different I cultures just around the world, you know that. what I mean? Like yeah. you, you, you could look at it like, oh, my gosh, step, step away, step away. Come step on, away. let's bring you back a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, go go into it. Well, Shield. I think, I think Give the, us your natural, rant. the natural human reaction towards an icon or a statue is it's a representation. I do, no Catholic thinks this is St. Francis himself, and I should worship it. We don't worship statues. They are physical representations of things that are meant to be used to draw the mind towards what they're contemplating. They are not gods themselves. Now, in the Old Testament times, there was a very, there was a very strict prohibition against graven images. Now, Why? Because they used images to, to evangelize they, more than they did. No, in the Old Testament, right. they literally thought this piece of stone was God itself. That's They literally thought this statue is our God. And when a culture would be overtaken by another, they would take their God, 
and either destroy it or take it back to their capital and say, we have your God, our God is greater. Oh. Now, that's a silly concept. God cannot be contained. God is not a thing, right? So the, the, the prohibition against graven images, number one, was definitely not as strict as people make it out to be. Um, but it was really designed so that people would stop considering a God a thing and look at God in his transcendent nature, God without time and without border. I, I, dude, I look at it like this, man. You come to my house, I got pictures up of my family. You know, I mean, like, they they represent my child at a certain age. I reflect on their life, you know. It's like... That's not your child, though. It's an image. It's an image, right. right. But, but it, what it does is it draws my mind, right, into... Reflection. That's precisely know? it. Even in my in my inner chamber of my room, I have this this tall chest of drawers, and on top of it, I have images and prayer cards of my grandparents there. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I look at them or I look at that prayer card, it guides my thought pattern. Mm -hmm. You know, to reflecting on them in a prayerful manner. And I have images of Christ there on. It's almost like a little devotional altar that I have yeah. in, in my room. And I think that's so important to realize that, that in the sanctuaries of our church, we need to catechetically guide people to the realities of what the saints have done, mm -hmm. the martyrs, the apostles, because this reminds us not only about them and our relationship with them, but also what we're called to do. And, and who we're supposed to be. And what I was saying before is like the church in before the printing press, you know, scripture was not everywhere. It, it was, it was held in, in churches and, in, you know, it was, it was revered right as a book. And, and so they used images to, to catechize people. Like, Amistad, you know, the movie is uh, a, a fantastic example. Never seen it. Oh, it's excellent. You Amistad. know, it's, and you have these slaves that are brought over on the slave ships and they start to recognize through the images and the cross mm -hmm. and the stained glass windows. It was communicating a story and it was convicting them in faith just in the transmission of what that what that was. Yeah. Not a lot of people could read back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of this is based on the fact that, well, in in the Old Testament, thou shalt not have graven images. Um, Protestants hold that as the second commandment, right? They have a different version of the Ten Commandments than we do because mm. they have a different division. They use a different version of it. The Ten Commandments are in Scripture twice. They use the prior one, and then they have a different way of dividing it, uh, whereas the mm, not having gra graven images falls for us in a different way than it does for them. Now, but that's not even the case in the Old Testament. I mean, on the Ark of the Covenant, there was graven images of cherubs. On the pillars of the temple, there was graven images. Um, and then especially after the incarnation. Dude, Moses, man, he comes down and they're like, they got the calf out again. And he's like, come on, guys. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> we after, just talked about that. <laughs> now, but in the East, they have icons, right? And you'll never see an icon of things that happened in heaven or hell because nobody saw them. But with the incarnation, there's statues of Jesus because these are things that happened. It's more of a historical image than it is a God. So we don't worship statues. Stop saying it. It's stupid. Ew. If you think that having an image is worship, go and burn all the pictures of your kids, burn the picture of your sweet little Protestant mama, and get rid of all. <laughs> Quit looking at the TV. Love Ryan. I know. Don't Ryan look at newspapers. Here, Ryan <laughs> Shield. Please, well, for heaven's sake. Well, let's be consistent. Shut your mouth. <laughs> let's be consistent. If you don't, if you're against graven images, be consistent. And Mama Protestant, her pictures need to be burned. Otherwise, stop it. I'm sick of hearing it. <laughs> all right. Next one. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Catholics don't believe in the Bible. They believe in man-made traditions. I'm sick of hearing it. It's. We don't believe in the yeah. Bible. No, well, we, something that, that's so that is sola scriptura. Scripture alone is uh, to all be used to guide the Christian life. That's, that's all you need. That's stupid. Yeah. It's not all you need. It's dumb. And stop saying it. I'm sick of hearing it. I, I believe uh, it was Scott Hahn, and I, I love his conversion story because he was in the church, 
and he was sitting in there. I think it was Scott Hunt. It might've been somebody else. And he's taking notes to really underline where Catholics are not, you know, using the scriptures. And And he went through the whole mass and he realized the entirety of the celebration of Catholics worship is purely founded in scripture and revelation. And it blew his mind. Yeah. I, I love that. And the traditions flow out of this, out of the realities of Eucharist and the solemn celebration of the gathering of that kahal, of the gathering of the people. Right. And you look at, look at how scriptures form, right? I mean, you, you can't say only scripture, right? Because, because it just didn't fall from heaven, right? So you, you had, you had tradition, you had people, you know, interacting with God and then God inspiring them to, to write Right. So, so you can't even have scripture by itself. It's impossible. You had to have people and God interacting with them to get to that point to where it was written. Well, I mean, and, and it's a wellspring. We already talked about it. Scripture wasn't even defined until the, into the, about the year 400 and it's only been around 2000 years. So, I mean, 400 out of 2000 years, there was no Bible to be the ultimate arbiter of what right. Christian life should be. So what was it? It was the church. It was tradition. Now Catholic church has Lowercase tradition and capital T tradition, which is sacred tradition. You want to explain the difference? So there's difference between tradition and custom and the traditions of our faith that we celebrate, for example, in Eucharist or the dogmas or traditions of, you know, feast days and whatnot related to the person of Christ is capital T tradition. The lower T tradition is more of like the customs and the cultures of the people that give expression. So something that I'm thinking of is, you know, the word the incarnate, you know, comes into the midst of the world incarnatus s in the in the flesh jesus is this is the word incarnate the logos made flesh so in that manner you know when we receive the word and it comes inside of us and we are we are kind of infused or or uh the word inseminated comes to mind because it's it's giving birth to something new inside of us this new birth of baptism then how is it expressed it's expressed through culture. It's expressed through custom. It's expressed through a common reality of what this does to, to a people and how it influences them. And this is how all these like little T traditions begin in and around the world. But there's something that's universal, well, one, like you know, the celebration big, of mass. Yeah, big T tradition is, is the public. It, it's, it's, it's as weighty as scripture. It is the de- revealed word of God. Uh, just in a different media. Um, it is something that was revealed through the apostles. It's something that was revealed through the pillar of truth. Now, people who say that we don't follow the Bible, we follow man-made teachings. Number one, there's Christians and there's no Bible. So there was something that was guiding the church. Who was that? It was the church. It was... So in the um, in First Timothy... Um, they say the pillar of truth is tradition. Tradition is the pillar of truth. What has been passed on to you by the other apostles. That's how they were able to have the authority to set canon because they are the pillar of truth. They are the arbiters. So how can you have a faith with no Bible and then say, well, all of a sudden the Bible shows up. Now, if you didn't follow that, there was no faith. It's, it's a, uh, the timeline doesn't work. Right. It's a yin and yang. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So what's the next uh, conflict here? Ryan Shield. That the church. But this time you're going to be a little bit more charitable, Am right? I? In your delivery. Am I? You were I good on that last one. You were, you were good. good. That was that was better. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm impressed. Okay. Well, then let good. me reel that back. <laughs> Saying that Catholics follow man-made traditions and not the scripture is stupid. You means you don't understand scripture or tradition. You understand neither. So stop saying it. I'm sick of hearing it. It's dumb. <laughs> Gosh. Better? Better. A lot better. We're not ready to put him on the front lines yet. Okay. Yes. <laughs> You're sitting back in your comfy tent. I'm on the front lines, man. I'm an enlisted man. You're a general. So. I, I can't wait to get into the science. Well, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Oh, perfect. So Catholics oppose science. Now yeah. we've done episodes on this. But I'm sick of hearing it. It's so stupid. Catholics do not oppose science. Catholics created science. Catholics created so many things that developed the understanding of the physical world that it's not, 
what you understand as science is not even possible without the contributions of Catholics. So to say that the Catholic Church hates science is a stupid canard. I'm sick of hearing it. Stop saying it. Yeah, like that guy from Nacho Libre. And <laughs> you believe in science? <laughs> you hate me because I believe in science? <laughs> but yeah, it's so important, Sheila, and you're absolutely right. How many people throughout history are were Catholic priests that contributed greatly to scientific revelation and development? And how many astronomers, how many scientists, how many chemists, how many, you've got to remember that in the history books that you read, it may not say that this person was a Catholic priest. It may not say that there was a reverend in front of their name. Yeah, like Copernicus. Copernicus, for example. It, that's, that's a perfect example of he that. Was a, he was a priest? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know if he had been paying attention in the episode that we did, Catholic Contributions yeah, to Science. Yeah, I don't remember you saying he was a priest, though. He was. Mm-hmm. He is, yeah. I was actually just watching something earlier uh, this past week on that. But no, it, it's so important. You're absolutely right, Sheil. You know, there's a, a, a fantastic quote from John Paul II that I really want to give to you right now. And it says... Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. In fact, such a dialogue is basically inevitable. As the Pope points out, isolation between the church and the scientific community is not a real option. We have to realize that the, the, rea- the relationship between science and religion is essential for this in statu vie of our human life, this state of journey and the state of movement. I think it was von Balthasar who, who talked about it as a, a state of becoming that, you know, we are moving in the direction of the absolute that is God. And how God manifests his creation is something to be studied and evaluated scientifically so that we may come to a greater intelligentsia, a greater understanding and knowledge and wisdom of the creative hand of God that leads us into that wonder and awe. You're absolutely right. there's, There's a very big reason why what we know of as science in the Western world developed in a culture created by Catholics, Jews, and Muslims. Right. That's because they all believed in a singular God who was rational, 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 (laughs) who was knowable and was ordered. The whole presupposition was that everything had a reason, had a meaning and could be defined. Other cultures before that said, well, things can spontaneously show up and go away. There's no rationality. There's no pattern. There's no underpinnings to creation. But in a Judeo-Christian and or with the Islamic culture, we believe that God underpins all things. Therefore, all things are knowable. So you wouldn't have science rise up in other areas now. And that that's what led to Catholic scientists like Copernicus and Mendel and Lemaitre and Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, um, Gassendi and Boscovich, right? People who made fundamental contributions to science without whom there wouldn't be things like astronomy, astrophysics, um, bi- uh, genetics, metallurgy, the scientific method itself, earthquakes. Catholics are not opposed to science. Stop saying it. It's stop dumb. saying it's dumb. Stop saying it. <laughs> Just but stop. we love you. <laughs> Next conflict. All right. <laughs> Why do you call it conflict? <laughs> yeah. Why? Why? This is not confrontational. I'm, feel, I'm, feel, I'm feeling it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I love to see Shield right, just get so animated. All right, here's one that I'm sick of hearing is that Catholics can just go do whatever they want and sin and then go to confession. And it's cool. So that there's really, you know, confession makes Catholics not culpable for anything that they do. Presumption of the Lord's mercy, Oof. man. That's a rough one. That's Scary. really stupid. Mm-hmm. That's not at all what Catholics teach about confession. Oh. Uh, there's reliance on his mercy, right? Which gives you comfort, but it's not, it's got to come through contrition. But but isn't, isn't it true that in the confessional people confess the same thing over and over and over again? And even in, in my relationship with the confessor, it's like, I go before the confessor with similar sins and struggles. 
you know, the things that are triggers for me to act selfishly or to act indifferent to the needs of people in my life because of personality differences or, or conflicts because somebody hurt my feelings and, and now I'm acting in a very absent way Mm -hmm. to their good. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's so, it's so true. What draws you back to confession, Ryan? Well, I mean, like, I mean, just before I share that is just like, you look at Pope John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II, him, he went to confession like every Every day, week, every Every, week, you know, he went a lot. Right. Mother Teresa. I mean, he, he, he wasn't in the confessional, like with new sins every day. He's just a aware of it. And, you know, we all have tendencies, right. To, to sin in a particular way. Um, just, and it, it teaches you about yourself, right. Contrition is like, man, this is where, this is where my gifts are too. You know, I have gifts here that God wants to use, but I'm kind of manipulated by, you know, sin here in, in this, in this way. So, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, you know, if you confess the same thing over, you got like a problem and it's like, no, no, I think you're just more and more aware of yourself. I mean, the greatest saints were like so aware of their sins. They're just like, this just sucks. Yeah. Like I, you know, but the idea that Catholics can just do whatever they want, you know, it's um, dumb. Stop saying it. It's dumb. It's stupid. (laughs) That is not even how confession works. So for everyone who thinks that a Catholic can just do whatever they want, and go to confession and get away with it. That's that's not how confession works. So for everyone who thinks that, let me give you a little bit of insight into what the actual requirements are for a valid confession. So for a confession to be valid, a person has to have really thoroughly examined their conscience and gotten all of their sins and is not withholding anything. They are fully confessing. Now, here's the second requirement is that they have to be contrite. They have to be repentant and have to really desire not to do this sin again. Otherwise, this confession is not valid and their sin is not forgiven. If somebody is a non-repentant murderer, he can't murder someone, go to confession, like, you know, wipe me clean and then be done with it. It has to be a real conversion of the heart. Otherwise, even if the priest says your sins are forgiven, they are not forgiven because it is an invalid confession. Isn't that correct? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's all dependent upon conscience, conciencia. With knowledge, you are coming to realize and acknowledge the fact that this is a sinful thing. Right. This is purely a, a selfish motive that does not build communion or relationship with anyone. It actually does the reverse. So that is why conscience helps us to examine our conscience and then go to confession, confessing in a repentant manner. This is something I do that I do not want to do anymore. Help me. Right. Stop saying it. So stop saying it. It's not true. (laughs) Catholics cannot do anything. If they do that, what you think that Catholics do with confession, they're not actually being forgiven and you're wrong. So stop saying it's stupid. I'm sick of hearing it. And this goes out to most of our listeners are Catholic. You know, you may have not gone to the sacrament of reconciliation for a long time and you may not even know where to begin. Talk to your priest. Just go set up an appointment and just say, hey, listen, I haven't been in confession in a long time. I would love to go. I just need a little bit of help because confession is such a beautiful gift from Jesus Christ to the apostles to go out and to forgive sins. And we are still celebrating that capital T tradition of, of hearing and listening to the needs of the human heart that falls prey to temptation and to obsession and falls into sin. And this is a relieving sacrament. It is a beautiful sacrament. And it's something that I absolutely love to do every single day that God gives me the opportunity to hear confession. All right. Here's another one I'm sick of hearing is that uh, Catholics can buy heaven through indulgences. (laughs) This is dumb. It's not true. Stop saying it. This is going back to what Martin Luther was trying to get away with in the 1500s. All you Lutherans, I'm sorry, but he was wrong on this one. He was just, you know, he witnessed a lot of abuse. He did. And and, and and there's, and he needs to honestly be recognized as someone who was confronting ideologies and the misuse of indulgences. He he is like a, a baseball player whose career got ended too early. He could have been one of the great reformers of the church and could have been St. Martin Luther. But he he zigged when he should have zagged. And it's, I I look at him as one that kind of got away because he, on a lot of points, he was right. There was a lot of abuses, but you cannot buy heaven through an indulgence. That is not how an indulgent works. You can't get someone into heaven by paying money to the church. That's, that's not at all how it works. So in order to get an indulgence, that there, 
there's a couple things that have to have happen. What is an indulgence? Like it, it, precisely. What, what is it? Like, I mean, an indulgence is now this is from directly from the catechism. An indulgence is a remission before God for the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. All right. So you go to a judge and you stole a car, right? You got a couple things. You stole the car and you wrecked it. Well, one, you get jail time for breaking the law. The second is you have to make recompense for having stolen and destroyed that car. So you get a fine as well, right? So those are your two punishments. Jesus Christ, uh, through his sacrifice, got rid of the jail time. You can get to heaven. He paid that price for all sins. Now, you still have... You a, still have a record. You still have... <laughs> you, yeah, basically. You still, you still, it's still on still your rap sheet. <laughs> and that's... You have to make reparations for it. You have to repay that debt of sin. It's not the, it's not the punishment of sin, of the, the guilt. It's the temporal recompense. And that's what a indulgence does, okay? Um, and when you think of indul- like think of, think of indulging... Yeah. You know, like I indulged in, you know, ice cream, cheesecake, cheesecake last night. Yeah. Oh man, I was enjoyable. It, it, you know, to, to indulge in the freedoms that come from the faith and your participation in it. So think of one of the indulgences that I know that comes off the top of my head that I interacted with when I was much younger in my reversion days was 30 minutes of reading the scriptures. There are certain indulgences ascribed to that. The reality of it is when you read scripture for 30 minutes, there's a certain, you know, piece of you in spirit that you're actually really entering into, man, I'm enjoying, this is beautiful. Indulging. I'm indulging in this, this form of exercising, you know, my spirituality. And there are enjoyments that come to a certain point of degree in indulgences that are offered in the church because it is a way to pastorally guide the the mm-hmm. and shepherd the children of the Holy Mother Church to these realities that they should participate in regularly. Now, did you guys ever get in trouble and have to go before a judge when you were young? Oh, my mother was the, the judge of all judges. No, I'm talking an actual <laughs> go, go before a court for a judge. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah. When you, <laughs> so when you're 17, 18, 19, you don't know, you tried to, you got caught buying beer or whatever, you have to go and whatever, or... Or maybe you stole a bunch of street signs and wrecked a car when you had beer in it. I don't know. Who knows what you did? Are you so, asking me? <laughs> <laughs> so you go before the judge, right? And you have a you have a good judge, and the judge you have a good you have a good attorney, and the attorney gets no jail time. Okay, that's essentially what Jesus did for you. He made that payment. Now you still have to make the payment back. You don't have any money. Your mom cuts the check and says, "I'm going to pay your fine." Okay. Because your mom has done good deeds, she's earned money, she able, she has the ability to do that. That's kind of how an indulgence works, right? You had two punishments, they've both been wiped away. One by your mom, one by the judge. That's, that's it. You can't buy heaven. It's a, dispense in, a dispense, dispensation of the superabundant works of, of the saints Redemption. and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that the church can dispense based on penitential acts. And it's in the context of retribution and, and truly in the sense of what penance is supposed to do, it moves us in the direction of making right what has been done wrong. So it's stop saying it. You guys don't understand indulgences. You can't just buy your way into heaven. Stop saying it's dumb. It's dumb. Dumb. Why don't you, instead of worrying about that, don't, you can't buy your way into heaven, but you can buy your way into a book. Go read one. It's cool. It's fine. They're great. They have all these words in there. It tells you exactly what it is. Don't presume to know that you know what an indulgence is. If you don't, buy a book. Read it. (laughs) It's cool. It's fine. Books are great. The love and the warmth in the room. They even have ones with pictures in it. Would you believe it? (laughs) Those are the books that I like to read. (laughs) St. Joseph or the Baltimore Catechism. Baltimore Catechism or the St. Joseph's uh, Bible too. It's cool. Uh, um, Okay. We got two left, right? Yeah. All right. The church hates gay people. Mm. I'm sick of hearing it. It's not true. The church does not hate gay Stop people. Stop saying it. Seriously. Do you know, I, I feel I feel so um, pained by this because this just happened yeah. this past Sunday. But um, there was a couple, a lesbian couple that were in the church and they were, um, you know, listening. And, and um, I woke up that morning and there was an article 
uh, that was, you know, written and, and, you know, and distributed about gay clergy and how th these gay clergy are, you know, upset about the church is not a closet, it's a cage, you know, and, and, the, and the church is ultimately caging their sexuality and whatnot. And in the, in the homily, I just said, you know, where are we in our culture right now? where that is what we're talking about. That's what priests are talking about. How base can we be just to talk about human sexuality as like, this is the greatest defining principle of, of who our existence, is. of it's who not. a human person is. No, there's so much more. There's so many greater goods out there that this is what we're, th this, is this is what priests are talking about yeah. when we have the beatitudes that we can crack open and look at. Like, that's what I was, that's what I was saying. There's greater freedom in the sense of the disciplines of faith and the disciplines of justice and equity and distribution of goods and being present to all people who are suffering and poor and disenfranchised. There's greater realities of love out there in those types of commitments right. and, and missions and not our individual sexuality of what I'm attracted right. to. So if it's like, okay, I'm attracted to a guy, I'm attracted to a girl, I'm attracted to a tree, I'm attracted to, you know, yeah, whatever it is, that's a thing. There's, there are, there's like an, or, there is an orientation toward, um, I forget the name of it right now, but Arbor sexual, whatever it is. There's so many, there's so many different things that, that, uh, that, that Look. our human sexuality comes in contact with and recognizes it's beautiful. And you know, the, so the thing is, is it's not about that people. Right. And I, I said that, but there was the less couple came out and I said, God bless you guys. Have a beautiful, have a beautiful week or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of like nodded their head and they, they walked past me and they almost looked disappointed. And, and it was just like, I'm, I hope that you heard what I was saying, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And I don't, I, I presume the fact that they don't. Yeah. Right. My, my lens is like, you know, if you look at, if you look at history here in the last, you know, 50, 60 years, yeah, there was a time where, you know, people were rude and mean and, and hateful to these people and, and they were suffering, you know? And, and I think if anything, the, our church has, has learned to, you know, accept them where they are and love them. Well, the church has always taught that. I it's think always that taught that. The, the, the people who make up the body of the church have a better understanding of that now. And, and people hold, you know, what, what Pope Francis said at the beginning of his pontificate, you know, who am I to judge as this kind of, oh, Pope Francis, the first time in the history of the Catholic church no. is saying these things. No, he's, he's expressing what is actually in the catechism. Right. right. So in the catechism, it, it specifically says that it says the number of men and women who have deep seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. There is, it is not a just a couple people. So it's not a non-consideration. It's definitely enough people that there needs to be a real theological consideration of this orientation and that any sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. It is specifically in the official teaching of the Catholic church to discriminate unjustly against uh, homosexual persons based on their orientation is Contrary to the love of God and a sin. The Catholic Church teaches that specifically it is a sin. Not that we hate gay people. It's a sin to hate gay people. That is specifically what we are against. Right. So stop saying it's dumb. It and, is. And that type of dis discrimination, like you were saying, Ryan, you know, in the, in the history that, you know, people were very poorly treated. But even still today, there's, there's countries that lock people up. Yep. You know, for for an expression of same sex attraction, and that's unjust. That is absolutely yeah. unjust, and the church needs to be in those places, calling people to greater justice and equity, and greater fellowship, right. and walking together in our journey. So, in 1986, uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger wrote a really, really great letter. It's called "The Letter to the Bishops of the Catholic Church on the Pastoral Pastoral Care of Homosexual Persons," and inside of it, he wrote something that I think is really needs to be more read and more understood about the church's relationship to uh, those with Same different or, yeah. or different orientations. Uh, mm -hmm. The human, and this is a direct quote, the human person made in the image and likeness of God can hardly be adequately described by a reductionist reference to his or her sexual orientation. Everyone living on the face of this earth has personal problems and difficulties, but challenges to growth, strengths, talents, and gifts as well. Today, the church provides a badly needed context for the care of the human person when she refuses to consider this person as a heterosexual or homosexual and insists that every person has a fundamental identity, 
the creature of God and by grace, his child and heir to eternal life. That's beautiful. The, that is. is the, that is it's gorgeous. I love Pope, Pope Benedict, Benedict saying, we are not going to say you are this, this is, you like doing this with your junk. So that's what you are. And that's all you are. That's, that's not what the church teaches. <laughs> it's stupid. Quit saying it. Stop it. Lord have mercy. <laughs> well, that's, that's the truth. Lord have oh, mercy. The last one, man. All right. The last one. And this is another thing that's going on that, I, again, people just fundamentally misunderstand. That stop saying it. Stop saying it. <laughs> and you're going to want to tell people to stop saying this, too, because I'm sure you've heard it, is that the vow of celibacy in the church causes uh, sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. It's not true. Not mm-hmm. true. Stop saying it. I'm sick of hearing it. And the statistics prove that as well. I absolutely. Mean, it's, it's so loud in your face. It's a, it's a human issue. It is absolutely a human issue. And it's something that we need to look at. You know, for sure. But yeah, that that's definitely out there all the time. And when celibacy is truly lived, it's it's a form of great intimacy. And we were talking about it this morning, actually, just in conversation, how Ryan Shield was sharing about his experience of being a father to his son and what is that going to look like in heaven? And and also Delacross and I were talking about his love for his kids. And then one of my one of my kids that I work with, you know, she, who's now married, newly newly wed, um, did their wedding just under a year ago, called me because she was in need of spiritual direction. And we had a 10, 15 minute conversation. And it was just so beautiful because the affective movement of my heart was just so paternal. And I just sat here, sat there and I thought like, God, thank you so much for allowing me to be a channel of your fatherhood in your children's life. Mm. And I'm so appreciative of that fact. But that's what celibacy points to is the heavenly realities of how we interact with one another on a deep familial love, as well as an agape love, a godly love that is not indifferent at all. Like it is, it is truly choosing the other and pouring out love in perfection, perfection for the sake of the other, for their good. And we, I get little tastes of that. And I would have never had that if I didn't enter into the state of celibacy for the sake of the kingdom, for sure. Yeah. I mean, being celibate and living a voluntary celibate life does not all of a sudden turn a person into someone with a pedophilia. Pe- no. it it's, 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 that, that's not it's how it impossible. works. That's, you know, I mean, if that was the case, all the guys out there who are not good at meeting women and getting into a marriage would, would be all be pedophiles. Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't work that way. It's, yeah. That's not how psychology of, of human sexu- sexuality works. So stop saying it. And stop saying it. Now, and even if you look at the celibate clergy um, and you go back to the last 60 years where they've really tracked all these cases, Somewhere between two and a half and four percent of clergy have committed sexual abuse, which is way too high and a staggeringly high number. But that is far lower than the same rates among non celibate teachers, non celibate um, coaches. Coaches, yeah, the data is there, and yeah. and the the highest rate of uh, sexual abuse abuse is occurred by married men um, to children in their own family. That's the highest rate. Celibacy does not cause sexual abuse. It does not cause pedophilia. It does not cause uh, ebiophilia. It doesn't cause those things. That's not how psychology works. So to say that, um, number one, even that there's a higher rate of abuse in the Catholic Church is statistically proven wrong. And that to say that celibacy causes that, again, statistically, scientifically, and psychologically is incorrect. It's stupid. Stop saying it. I don't want to hear yeah. it anymore. Focus on the sufferers, right. you know, right. and, and, and loving them. And, and celibacy. I, I had this awesome conversation with a transgendered person in uh, Sonoma when I was driving up to go for the graduation in Gonzaga this past year. And I didn't have my collar in. I was having some beers. I wanted to play in pool. And me and this transgendered person were, you know, we were on the same team. And we, we were the same exact age, had same cultural references, and we were really having a great time just in conversation. Spent like two and a half hours. But, I mean, was that a transgender person or was that just a person? It was a person. Right. So, you know, like after two and a half, three hours um, of, of hanging out, we were sitting there and having a beer and talking. And, and then next thing you know, um, it says you know, she says, um, you know, what do you do, Rich? Because <laughs> like, what do you like? And I said, well, I don't know if you want to know what I do. Uh, <laughs> and then she's like, now I really want to know what you do. I uh, said, 
well, I'm a Catholic priest. And she's like, I would have never talked to you. Yeah. Right. And I said, and how do you feel like I feel toward you? I said, she's like, good. And I said, do you feel like I have love for you? And, and she's like, yeah, I, I do. And I said, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And I said, and she started talking about the transgender movement and the experience of being a part of that and all this stuff. And then, so in the midst of it, I said, you know, you're, you're trying to express yourself in a, in a sexual manner. Right. And you're doing that. But I think, you know, and, and there's a movement like th this is something that's persecuted this expression but I said, I think celibacy is actually more persecuted than anything else, any yeah. other expression, because it's an expression that says sexuality is not my greatest fulfillment. It's yeah. How it, dare you say that in 2019? I know. I, sex is the only thing that matters. After you the just sexual revolution till now, right. I mean, now we're still running down that same path of if I express myself sexually, this is the greatest good, good. of my yeah. human existence. Like, no, like, so, uh, you know what it is? Everyone's logging so badly oh, for so communion. True, they, that's exactly they, what it's they about. They need true communion. That's exactly what it's and about. And they think that sex is the, the path to true communion. Yeah. And it's not. Uh, sex is a, a unit of function between a man and a woman for, uh, in God's design. But the union of a person is, is love. And you're only going to find that through... You're never going to find that through any sexual orientation. You're going to find that through true self-giving love and the love of another That's right. person. That's right. So to to chase sex as the greatest good is always going to leave people empty, and you're going to lend to more and more sexual confusion in our culture and in our society and so dissatisfaction and like the absentia in the in the heart right. because the heart is hungering for more, yeah. and always will. Yeah. And our hearts will be restless until they rest in you. Amen. Saint Augustine, right. pray for us. Yeah. All right, so those are 10 things that, you know, we're sick of hearing. So if you listen to this episode uh, and you've ever said any of those things, don't say it ever again. Ever because again. You don't need to. We're sick of it and stop saying it. <laughs> and just through this one podcast, everyone's healed. Everyone. Damn. So good job, we thank Father you Rich. so much for joining well, us. I mean, priesthood. You got that thing down. <laughs> oh, no, I'm still working on that. But still working on that. And it, and it is. It's a state of becoming, man. It's in statu VA and siempre adelante. Move forward always. And we're growing together and we're walking together. And that's what matters most. And I just love being here with you guys. I love being here with the cast media staff and, and doing these podcasts because this gives us a deeper sense of our solidarity walking together. So we thank you so much for joining us and subscribing on all of our platforms, supporting us online and going on YouTube and going on Stitcher and iTunes and Spotify and all of our platforms. And we just appreciate your love. Don't forget, check us out, Patreon. You know, click that link, give us some support and love so that we can continue to build our ministry online. Amen. All right. Well said. See you next time. God bless you. Cheers. <laughs>